Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Pepe from Holy Family Conference, and I'd like to welcome you to Beginners Caseworkers training. Um, just as a point of reference, this is the 12th virtual training class we have done since July 2021. Uh, all the ones with the check marks are the ones that we've completed. And if you missed any of those, or if you want a refresher, you can go out to the CMS support community website and you can um, watch the videos. And we also have handouts. Now, some of the things that I will be going through or I will not be going through are the ones that we've already had a training class on. And the example that I'll use here is like attachments. When we get into the casework workflow, I will skip over that tab. I will not go through that. If you wanna learn about attachments, go out to this video. On the left-hand side are the upcoming training that we have planned. Um, we don't have any dates on them yet. Stay tuned, watch your emails and the support community website for registration. But the last bullet on that right-hand side is probably the most important. We would like your ideas, your input, and the type of training you would like to see. So if you have any ideas, any suggestions, send Amanda an email so that we can consider it when we're going through putting together the training catalog for the remainder of 2022 and 2023. Okay, I thought we start off with the process. So we understand what the casework steps or the processes are. Uh, so what I've done here is laid out the entire case management process. Case management is just an umbrella term for intake being one piece of it and casework being another piece of it. We will not be discussing anything in intake that was a separate training session. We're gonna pick up this story, this video, as we go into the casework section, the last four boxes. And we'll go through the casework workflow where we'll look at what do we do in a pre-visit preparation phase, the post-visit entry phase, the request assistant phase, and probably the most important is closing the case. You'll hear me say this over and over and over again, especially new case workers. Your last job when you are done with the case is to close it because if you don't close it, it will not be recorded on the reports and your conference will not get any credit for the number of people that you help. That's why it is really, really important that you adopt the discipline to close the case. So I wanted to give you the overview of exactly what the whole case management process looks like, but we're going to zero in on just the casework piece. So when we pick up this story, somebody has already assigned you, a case intake person has already assigned you a case. That's that's where we're gonna pick it up. Okay, uh, this is just a layout of the areas of the system we are going to touch upon and discuss. I'm not gonna read them to you, you can read them, but these are the kinds of things that we'll be going through when we go through the demo. Okay, probably the best place to start is if, if I was a new caseworker, uh, what I want to do is to make sure all my settings are right, because the settings kind of control the way that the system behaves the way you want it to behave, because my settings might be different than your settings. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into CMS, okay, and we're going to get rid of this thing right here, hopefully, so I can see. Okay, so new caseworkers. I'm not sure how familiar you are, but this is your homepage. 
this is where you can get to any time by clicking this button, home. All of these buttons going across here, they're what we call persistent buttons. What that means is that no matter where you are in CMS, these will always stay persistent up on top. So no matter where you are, you can always click the home button, okay? This is your message board area. Very, very important to a caseworker. And I'll explain it as we go through some cases. This is your main menu. And this is pretty much driven by the roles that you have been assigned. So if you're just a caseworker, that's the only role that's been assigned to you, more than likely you will see the first one, my assigned cases. You would see add volunteer task, and you would see unassigned caseworkers. The reason why you're seeing all this other stuff, privileges, is because I have other roles assigned to me. But if you're just a caseworker, just been assigned a caseworker role, or a secondary caseworker role, you would only see those three items on your main menu. So like I said, the first thing you should do as a new caseworker is go to my profile and look at your settings. Now I'm not gonna talk about everything on this page. I'm gonna talk about what's relevant to you as a caseworker. And the probably the most important piece is your email address. You need to make sure you have a valid email address because CMS is gonna send you emails. When you get assigned a case, CMS is gonna send you an email. When that treasurer pays your check request, CMS is gonna send you an email. When a case goes into an unassigned a case folder, CMS is gonna send you an email. I think you got my point. Email address is very, very important. If you leave it blank, you're not gonna get an email. You're gonna wonder about where your case went, you know, if you've been assigned or not been assigned. So I would make sure, validate that, that you got a valid email address. Then clicking over to the next tab, member availability. Uh, when a case intake person assigns a case worker, they look at an availability list. You might not be available all the time. If you are, you just leave this uh, check. By the way, that's the default. But let's say you're only available on weekends. You would write, you would key in only available on weekends and you click update. What what that means is when that caseworker goes to assign, I'm sorry, that case intake person goes to assign a caseworker and they come across your name, they're gonna see that you have a limitation. You're only available on weekends. So if that case is important and it's critical, it needs to be responded to today, and it isn't a weekend, more than likely they are not going to uh, they're not going to um, assign you as the caseworker. So you could uncheck it totally, which means that you're not available at all. Okay. Now, if you went on vacation, you might want to uncheck it so it won't become visible to the case intake person to assign you a case. When you come back, you can click it and you could move on from there. And that way there, then you could start taking cases. Next one is my roles. I keep getting this, Joe, every time I say um, What you need to check is to make sure you've been assigned a caseworker role. You can get into CMS without a caseworker role. You could be a conference member and get into CMS. So let's say that you're a new caseworker, you're ready to go, but you don't see anything, any way that you can work a case. More than likely, you haven't been assigned a caseworker role. What you need to do is contact your conference administrator, and he or she would be able to send us, 
to set you up and assign you a caseworker role. Then your email preferences. This is very important, as I was saying before. Uh, depend upon how you answer these questions. And by the way, the default, I believe, if you opened up your profile and you looked at the email preferences, they're probably all say yes. My advice to you is to leave them all yes until you get really familiar with the system. Then you could determine what you don't wanna see and what you do wanna see in terms of email addresses, e email sent to you, okay? So that's what I say is the very first thing you should do is check your settings. Okay, so we're gonna get into some scenarios. Scenario is that you've been assigned two cases. One with an ex that's an existing client and one that's a new client, okay? Now, what happens is when you're assigned a case and assuming that you had yeses in your pref email preferences, you will receive an email from CMS that says you've been assigned this case or give you the case number or give you the client's name. That's one notification. The other notification is in your message box right here, okay? Here's the two. I'm not gonna tell you yet which one's the new and which one's the existing, but there is one and there is, there is one that's new and one that's existing. Now, how do you access that? There are, you really will have two, what I call case work lists. One is my assigned cases, and the other one is unassigned cases for caseworker. That's where cases go when they're assigned to you. So how do you open up the case? There's really two ways you can get there. One is you go to my assigned cases, and you will see existing client, and new client, that's one way. The other way, the real short way of doing it, you just click on the message in the message box, it takes you right there as well. So either way will get you there. This requires two steps. You click on my assigned cases, you click on, click on existing and it got you there. This is the shortcut, takes you right there, okay? So we are going to work the case. So picture this, if you will, you have just been assigned this case. It was in your My Assigned Cases work list. You are ready to start working the case. So let me walk you through where we are. We are in the preparation phase. You have not done the home visit. You have not yet contacted the client. You just wanna learn about this case first, and then we'll move through contacting the client and that sort of thing. So what I would do is, these are called accordions. If you're not familiar with them, picture an accordion. It expands and it contracts. It's the same thing here. If I click on this, it'll expand. If I click on that, it contracts. So what you should do as a new caseworker for this case is to learn about this case. First thing I would do is open up the client information and look at the profile of the client. What, what's been collected so far by the case intake person. Now keep in mind, this is all that the case intake person knew. This happens to be an existing client. So obviously what was there before is what is been mirrored in this case record, but the situation could change. The client's marital status could be different now from the last time that we helped them. 
But anyway, this is what it is right now. This is, like I said, the preparation phase. You have not contacted the client, so you don't know anything. You're just trying to learn about the client. The next thing is I would click open the case instruction accordion. This is where a uh, case intake person might send you a message as the caseworker of something you should be aware of. In this case, I just put one in is the client works Monday through Friday. They're only available for a home visit on weekends. That's important information for you to know. So when you contact the client, you set up the home visit, you know their availability is only on weekends. And that might not be your availability. You might have somebody else needs to take the case. The next piece of information would be important is what did they request? This came in from case intake. This is what the client has requested. Doesn't necessarily mean this is what you're gonna give them. This is what their needs are. They need rent, they need utilities, and they need some food. The next thing you wanna know about the client is their past assistance. When was the last time that they were helped? Well, it looks like they were helped 9, 11, 2019. They were helped by a few, uh, two different conferences. So now you've learned about what's going on with the client. Okay. And I'm going to go back up to the prepare tab. The next thing that you probably would want to do is to uh, print out a case record form. Now you have two choices. You could print out a case record form for just this case, or you could print out one that has this case and all the history of the client. Most of our caseworkers like to have the history because you can read exactly what happened rather than go into the online system and paging, paging through. So you would click on this button. And you wait. It will come back, trust me. Okay, so here's the case record form that you can print out that has all the information about the case and then has information as you go down, you scroll down of all the history of this client. You can see this client has a long list of past assistants. I'll tell you any program history. In other words, have we refer them to a Christmas program or a Thanksgiving program? If they've ever been red flagged, what the reason was, any record notes. Record notes are notes that's put on the client's record permanently. It is not case notes. Case notes is only for the case. Record notes is at the client level. Those are two different things. So as you notice, the, the one that I put on the client level is this client has exceeded the number of times we assist in a lifetime. That's something regardless of what case or how many cases we have for this client, that will always be there until somebody deletes it. The other thing is you'll have the merge history and then what follows is case by case. If you go back up here, we had all these past assistances that were cases. You'll have case by case, all the information in newest to oldest sequence. So there's a 2018 case, there's a 2017, and you can read all the situation, everything about that case that was entered in, all of it. So, and you print that out, by the way. So you probably want to print out a case record form before, certainly before you go on the home visit. And by the way, you can print out a case record form anytime during the entire process. I'm just showing you how you gather all your information before you contact the client. So you can learn about the client. You could look at their history. And so when you call them, you're better prepared. The other thing that you might want to do if you're not familiar where they live, like if I went to the client record and I looked at, you know, where is it? Delk Road, I think it is. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can't really see the scrolling. But anyway, it's Delk Road. If, if I didn't know exactly where that was, I can ask Google to map it for me. Okay? So then I can get that. Joe, I need to get out of this. Yep. Yep, there we go. Okay, I want to lift this thing up here. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, the next piece of information that's very important is the client's phone number. You want to call them now and set up the home visit. So you go to the record and you see the client's phone number right there. So you would call the client, set up the home visit. So now you're prepared. You know everything there is to know about the client, what's happened in the past. You know about their current situation in terms of what they have requested. You have all that information. And now you set up the home visit with the client. You go on the home visit. You can bring your case record form, make some additional notes, because you're going to learn things on that home visit that are not in the system that you're gonna to have to come back and update the system, okay? So now the home visit is over with. You come back, you get onto CMS, you go to my assigned cases, you come up, you're still on the prepare tab. You are ready to move through the process. By the way, CMS will lead you through the process. You cannot just jump to assistance without passing through all of these tabs. Now you can tab backwards, but you cannot tab forward. So you don't need to worry about what do I do next? What do I do next? CMS will lead you through it. And all you need to do is click next, okay? So this is now post visit. You've gone on the visit, you got all your information, the first thing CMS can ask you to do is say, what kind of visit was that? As we know, because of the pandemic, we are doing a lot by telephone. Mm -hmm. And you might be talking to the client, but we do at Holy Family for existing clients, we are we're interviewing them over the telephone. For new clients, we actually meet with them. Every conference is different. A lot of conferences have gone back to the home visit model where they're actually going out in twos to visit with the client. That's fine. But you have to pick from one of these is what type of visit was it? Well, let's use home. The date of the visit and the date, it, although you probably never really got to this, maybe to the 12th, you can still backdate it to the 10th so you know exactly what the date was, okay? And the other thing, why can't I get up to that, Joe? It's just scroll down. Yeah, it's not. Could you? I can't see it. Can you wait with one second? Sorry. Hold on a second, got a little technical problem. Can't grab that. Yeah, I thought so. We can't, can't. Oh. Yeah. We're gonna have to reduce the font, I think. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. We we can't see some stuff because is that better? Is that what you needed? Yeah, that's what I needed. Okay. So you put in the visit type, you put in the visit date, it knows that you're the caseworker, you're assigned to it. And by the way, if you had a secondary. You could also put in the secondary. I'm not going to go through that. That is not beginner's caseworker. That's more advanced. But let's just say you're the only caseworker. If there wasn't a secondary, you need to record the time for that visit. Now, there's a little latitude here. <clears throat> this is all about the visit. It's not about the time you spent working on this case. But like everything else in St. Vincent de Paul, we have exceptions. You can, if you know that 
you know, the visit was 60 minutes, but I'm really going to spend 75 minutes. You could put in 75 minutes. You're not restricted to just the time that you spent on the visit. So whatever your conference guidelines are, use them. Some of us, you know, will just put in enough time to cover us for the entire time we're spending on the case, which there's a lot of time besides what you do in CMS in the home visit. Some conferences say, no, all I'm going to do is record the time we spent on the visit, and then I'm going to go into volunteer hours, which I'm going to show you later on, and actually put through time for case administration. Either way you decide it works. So I'm going to put in 60 minutes, but you got to put something here. And even zero is a valid entry, by the way. So you can put in zero miles, but I'll put in 10 miles. Okay. So on this page, I have completed um, the necessary information. By the way, and again, if you're new to CMS, anytime you see a red asterisk next to a field, that means it's required. Like you see the minutes, required. Miles, required. You see that all the way throughout CMS, okay? So we're ready to go to the next tab. By the way, one thing I failed to mention, I'm going to mention, and I want you to kind of park it because when we get to a new client, you're gonna see some changes. You see the button here, it says close case. <clears throat> At any time I can close this case, uh, let's say without assistance. That's because <clears throat> this is an existing client. That's why it says closed case. That will not be the case when we get to a new client. That button will say cancel. And I just want you to park that. We'll talk about it more later on. So now we're on the client profile screen, basically. So you just came back from the home visit and you've learned some new things. What new things have you learned? Well, the first thing you learned was that the client has food stamps. So you wanna click that off. You also learned that the client uh, is on Medicaid. You might wanna click that as well. The other thing that you learned is the client's no longer single. The client is married. What you're doing is updating the record based upon the new information you learned on the home visit or on the visit, even if it's over the telephone. You might have also learned that the client has another phone number or that they gave you their email address. Say it's john at gmail.com, which is important because I know for us, we communicate a lot with our clients with email addresses. Now, it just so happened that the last time that we saw the client, they didn't give us their email address. If they give you their email address, my suggestion is that you update their record with the email address, because if uh, you might need it when you're communicating with them, especially when it comes time for assistance and you can't reach them. I do this an awful lot. As a caseworker, when I try to reach the client, and I can't get the client, I send them an email, tell them I will be calling them in the next half hour or whatever, and that's a way to communicate. A lot of our clients check emails, they don't check voice messages. Some of them don't even have voice messages. Okay, so you are basically updating the client's record. If they move, they might be still at the Gardens of East Cobb Apartments, but they're in a different apartment. You need to update the record. When you're done updating the client profile record, you click next. <laughs> I gotta keep saying this over and over again, I guess. Okay, so what CMS is saying is, okay, well, this is what the, the latest client information, notice. The food stamps is checked off, the Medicaid is checked off, they're married, 
That's the updated record. Here's the old record. They were single, none of that was checked off. Well, I want to update using the latest client information. So once I verify that, then I click update. It's telling me that this information is going to overwrite what's out on the database for this client right now. Do you want to do it? And I'll say, yeah, sure, do it. Because I want the latest information. Because when that client comes back through, now we've captured the latest information about that client, the client profile information. Now we have moved, we've advanced to the household tab. By the way, I said to you before, you cannot go forward, but you go backward. I could tab back there if I wanted to and you know, do what we did before. I can tab here if I wanted to, change that. But you can't go forward. You can always go backward if you need to correct something. So this is the household information. These are all the members that live in that household, that live in that apartment, that live in that house with that client, but it's not the client. It's excluding the client. So this is what was out on the record before. But on the home visit, you learned that granny lives there. So you're gonna add another household member. Granny Klein. You're gonna put in the date of birth or you can put in an age. I put in 75 years old and let the system basically calculate for me. 1947, that's all I'm gonna get. But obviously if you know the exact date of birth, put it in. You select the gender, notice, require field, require field, require field. You will not go very far if you try to get out of this now without completing the required field. That is an other relative and the ethnicity is Caucasian. Notice it's required. So I'm updating the record. I also, found out in the home visit that Mary client doesn't live there anymore. So I'm going to delete Mary from the household list. <clears throat> All I do is check the box. So when I click next, what's going to happen is Mary is going to be gone and Granny's going to be added. Okay? So we'll click next. I hate this. Thing. I, say, I, say. I don't know why it keeps coming up, but it is what it is. Okay. So we've updated the household members. And again, this is everything that you've learned on the home visit. Now, the most important part your notes. We call it situation. There are three screens situation screen number one, situation screen number two, and situation screen number three. One and three are going to be required that you enter something in. Two is optional. We're going to walk through them, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. This is probably the most important part, is that now you start logging in. Obviously, when you were on that home visit, you were taking copious notes of the situation, why the client needs the assistance that they need, who else they've contacted, all of that. So you uh, you put in the client is currently unemployed. Uh, doesn't receive any other income whatever everything anything that you know you need to put in here um by the way i think it we have a spell checker in here too maybe not i can't remember let's not so um 
this is where you put all your client, I call it the client notes area. This happens to be situation screen number one. So what you're doing is documenting their current situation. Obviously, somewhere in this, you would say needs assistance with June's rent. Owes $3,000, whatever. Okay, so you're just documenting their situation. Now, if I try clicking next here, hopefully it won't let me go. The reason is because you have to complete something here where it says client plan for the future. So this is their current situation. So what are they going to do about it? What's their plan to prevent this from not happening again? Um, are they going to budget better? Are they going to move to a one-bedroom apartment instead of a two-bedroom apartment? Are they going to get a roommate? Um, what are they going to do? Because obviously, when you look at, and we'll get to the income and expense page in a minute, you look at the income, you look at the expenses, and the natural question is, so how are you going to make this work going for uh, going uh, in the future? How, how's, how are you going to sustain yourself? So you're basically going to put the plan, the client saying, this is what I plan to do. I plan to move into a smaller apartment. And I know I spelled it wrong, less expensive and less expensive, okay? Uh, why it's not taken, doesn't matter. I'm not gonna correct my spelling. Uh, but anyway, what you, what you put here is what the plan is what the client's plan, not your plan, but the client's plan is for the future. By the way, we have some conferences. I know this for a fact. They document a very, very complete plan for the client that's agreed upon with the client. So when that client comes back and asks for assistance again, they go back to this case and say, so this was the plan. How did you do against this plan? And they actually use that as a barometer to determine how much or if any assistance they're going to give this client. They're very, very strict about that. Some conferences are not at all. They just put in whatever the client says, and that's fine. Like I said, everybody's different. Now we're ready to move forward. So you We've completed situation screen number one. We're ready to go to situation screen number two, which is the uh, employment and income and expenses. And I'm not going to spend time putting in data because we don't have the time, but you can do it. Uh, you just select full time, part time, how long you put in all of their income, you put in all their expenses. Like I said, this is an optional screen. Some conferences use this all the time and they require every one of their caseworkers to complete it. Some conferences say it's not important. It's going to be stale information the next time we talk to the client. So whatever your conference policy is, it is. But you can put in all of the financial information. This is required you must check at least one of these. You could check as many that applies, but you must check at least one. So if their situation was due to COVID, like they lost their job because of COVID, click COVID. If they have low or no wages, click that. If they have poor health, click that. This is important information. And it might not seem important to you as the caseworker. It's important to St. Vincent the Ball. We use this information 
There's back end reports coming out that Amanda runs, Jerry runs on the underlining causes that when we're applying for grants, this is very, very important information for us to secure those grants. That's why it's important that you capture the information at the source. Jerry and Amanda cannot make it up. It's got to come from you. We, CMS only requires that you check one. My recommendation is that you check all that apply. And you know something because you learned it on the, on the home visit, but you must check at least one. Okay, now we're gonna get to the fun part, assistance. Now, if after the home visit, I've determined that I am not going to give this client anything, for whatever the reasons, I would just close the case. I'm not gonna do that here. We're gonna actually close this case with assistance, but when we get to new client, we will close that case without assistance. Those are two ways of closing a case. We're gonna do this with assistance because I wanna walk through the assistance with you, okay? So let's say that we've determined we're gonna submit a check request. One is for rent. So we're gonna come down here. You actually have two housing choices. One is housing miscellaneous. The other one is housing rent. It's actually rent and mortgage. This is probably storage is another uh, option. And we do, we pay for storage at time for clients. But the majority of what we do is rent and utilities. So we're gonna, we're going to give this client some rental assistance. So the first thing is the category, it's rent. The next is the resource. Is it a mortgage or is it rent? It's rent. Now, we're going to get to account holder's name later on, especially with utilities. But you would enter uh, something here if the account holder, or in this case, the leaseholder, is different than your client. And by the way, that happens quite a bit. Sometimes clients cannot get into an apartment unless somebody co-signs for them. So they are not the leaseholder. The leaseholder could be their mother, could be their father, could be a friend. Somebody has guaranteed payment and they are the leaseholder. You need to put their name in there if it's different than the client. The next thing, as you can see, a red star means it's required, is the amount that you're going to give the client. So we're going to be generous. We're going to give the client $1,000, okay? The account number. Now, account number for a rent, what we do at Holy Family, you can do whatever you like because it'll take anything you give it. We put in the apartment number so that when our a treasurer writes the check, the physical check, they know the apartment number to put on the check. So when we send that check to the leasing office, they can post it, make sure it gets posted, not only to the client's name, which will be on the check, but the apartment number will be on the check. It's just a good practice. You don't have to adopt it. You could do whatever your conference tells you to do, but whatever you put in here, you must rekey here. Well, me being lazy, what I do is just a copy and a paste because I'm afraid I'm going to make a keying error for sure. Now, other, again, this is a freeform field. You can put anything in here. And the way we use it and most conferences use it is this information is all visible to your treasure. So it's a good way to send a message to the treasurer if you wanted to, because he or she is gonna look at it. What we do at Holy Family, if this treasure, if this check is going to get delivered, I would put in delivered to John Pepe, and I'll take it over to the leasing office. That tells my treasurer, when you write that check, give it to me. 
don't send it to the leasing office. I'm going to take it over there. And again, that's a free form field. You can put anything in it that you want. The way most conferences use it is some kind of message that they want to send to the treasurer. It might say electronic payment. So the treasurer knows, make this payment electronically. So we'll go to next. Okay. Say, <laughs> save. Save. Save? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The next page, if you will, we're still processing this rental assistance. It's the vendor screen. Mm -hmm. So now you're going to select the vendor. So the vendor category, you got two choices here with housing, housing and housing conference. Housing will bring up a global list of all entries that were made by all conferences of all apartments. I mean, it is mammoth. You don't want to pick that one. You want to pick the housing conference because if your treasurer is doing his or her job, they have already set up all the conference, all the apartments you do business with. Maybe the landlords that you do business with on a regular basis. So that's that's a way of getting the list. The drop down now will be only those apartment that I do business with, okay? And I would select one, Forest Ridge. Now, let's say this is a landlord. It's not an apartment and it's not my list because this is sort of like a one-timer. It isn't like I do business with this landlord all the time. I would click other vendor. I would put in the information, John, landlord. I put in the address and I'm just gonna shortcut this and put in a question mark. The address of uh, the city, state, Georgia, it's required. You can see the asterisk. Okay, this is who the check is going to get uh, uh, mailed to or is gonna be sent to, okay? Especially if you're mailing this check, you want to make sure that you mail it to the right person. But the vendor in this case is a landlord. It is not an apartment building. So you got a choice here. If it's one of your apartments that you do business with, more than likely your treasurer's already set that up and you just pick it from the list. If it's a landlord and it's not in the list, then you can write it in. Either way, we'll get you. Okay. So we come to the third screen. We still haven't yet processed the check request. See these two little small little boxes that everybody misses? You have to check them in order for this request to go through. What you're verifying is you're saying, yes, that payment information is correct. Yes. That landlord information, that, that vendor information is correct. And by the way, you don't know this, but by you checking those boxes, you are basically signing off that you have done your due diligence. This actually came from our auditors. Well, the auditors want to make sure is that the caseworkers actually verify either with the landlord or with the apartment, that in fact, the client owes $2,000 and you're giving them $1,000. So in effect, you are signing off that this information is accurate. That's what you're doing by clicking these two boxes. Now you're done. You click complete and there's the check request. But notice it says not submitted. I'll get to that part in a minute. Okay, hold it. But we have not submitted this check request to the treasurer yet. Not yet. I'm going to skip over pledges because I did a whole uh, virtual training on pledges. You go out to the to the website and look at the video and look at the handouts. If you're into pledges, 
do that, but that is not a beginner caseworker function. The next thing we're gonna give this client is a gift card and a voucher. These are gift cards and vouchers we purchased. There's a difference between what we purchased and what was given to us. We call what is given to us in-kind. Anything that was purchased, meaning your treasure, went out to Kroger and bought $500 worth of Kroger gift cards, food cards. We used our funds to do that. In kind, we did not use our funds. Those gift cards were given to us by parishioners, by friends, whatever. So we're going to first do a gift card and a voucher. So what we're going to do, we're going to give this client a gift card for food. The value of it is $50. In the other field, I would put in the gift card number. If you turn the gift card number, the gift card over, it's got this long string of numbers. You can do what you want. Typically, we only enter in the last five digits of that number because it's very, very long. But you might want to preface it by the date or whatever, or gift card dash one, two, three, four, five. But that's a way to reference that gift card, uh, what you're giving that client, the, the, the actual card itself. You could put it in comments here. It's for milk and bread because this is not something you store in your pantry. So you give them a gift card to go to Kroger to go get that or eggs or whatever. You click next. I hate that thing. <laughs> you pick a vendor category. Well, that happens to be other not listed because it's not any of these. It's food, right? It's a food gift card. And then you pick the vendor. It was a Kroger gift card. And then you click next. And now we have two things that we've given the client so far. We've given them a rent check, but we haven't requested yet to the treasurer and a gift card. The next thing we wanna probably give the client is a gas voucher. I don't know about your conference. I'll tell you about ours and some conferences do this. Uh, when we're working with a client, we determine that a client needs a gas voucher. Maybe it's because getting back and forth to doctor appointments, taking the kids to school, just going to work, or their tank is just empty. We give them a voucher to go to one of the local gas stations we do business with. They present that voucher. They fill up their tank. At the end of the month, that vendor sends us all of those vouchers, and we make one payment back to them. That's the way we do. However you do it, you do it. But in case you have to use a voucher, this is the way you do it. Same thing, you put in the amount. Gas, we normally would have done $30. These days, we're doing $50. Price of gas has gone up. You put in the voucher number. And this is, could be one of those paper vouchers. You could put in a comment, you know, taking Flying, uh, taking kids back and forth to school, whatever, just so that you'll have it. Vendor category, in this case, would be transportation. And coastal gas is who we do business with. That's what I would check off. It might be quick trip. Whatever your uh, treasurer has set up. So now, we have given this client, where am I, one o'clock. Okay, I gotta watch my time here. We've given them those two things. We're gonna move to in-kind. I'll probably only do one of these and I think you'll get the point. Um, now this is food that we've given a client from our pantry. So we clicked food and groceries, click food. Now, you value the food. This is variable, depend upon your conference. In our conference, we value one bag of food, $40. So if I gave that client two bags of food, I put in $80. And if I gave them frozen 
food, I might log it in here too, saying that I also gave them some frozen meat, okay? This is just to show you the in-kind. So from here, I would say, once again, that's other not listed and out of the Holy Family Pantry, okay? So now, this is everything we've given the client in terms of assistance. But as I said before, oh, I'm sorry, I wanna do one more check request, very important, utilities. So I'll come down here, click utilities, electric. Now, utilities, very, very possible that the account holder is different than the client, especially with utilities. And I'll tell you why. A lot of our clients cannot get their utilities turned on unless, of course, they have good credit, they leave a deposit, all of that. Typically, somebody else does that for them. And so the utility company would not know the client. If you sent this check in with the client's name, they wouldn't know where to post it. They only know how to post it two ways, one by the account holder or, or the, um, the street address, if you will, um, of where that utility actually is, or by the account number, which we're gonna get to in a minute. But the account holder name, if it is different than the client, in a utility, it's very possible, please put it in or else your treasurer is gonna be confused and will not write in the right name. They'll put in the client's name and that check is gonna get rejected by the utility company. So let's say that's for a hundred bucks. Now the account number, very, very important for utilities because the treasurer writes on the check the account number. They'll put the account holder's name if it's different than the client's name. When that utility company receives that check, they post that check by account number. So you need to make sure that your account number for your utilities, you capture that. And like I said, I'm pretty lazy. So I just do a cut and paste. And I might say in this case, pay this electronically. Just tell them treasure how to pay this because we need to get it there fast. They're gonna be shut off tomorrow. You pick the vendor category, which is utility. You pick the vendor, Marietta Power and click next. You verify everything just like you did the rent check. Everything looks good. Click complete. Okay, here's everything we're giving this client. But if you notice, the two check requests have not gone yet. These check requests don't go until you have advanced to this check pledge tab. Trust me, we're working on eliminating this, but please make sure you advance to that tab, because if you left the screen right now and you say, okay, I'm done. Treasurer got the check request. No, they did not. Not until that says submitted did they get it. So I'm gonna advance by clicking next. It's gonna take me to the attachment tab. And as I said, we're not gonna talk about attachments because I did a whole training session on that. That is more of an advanced function. There's a video, go learn about attachments. But when I click next to go to the check pledge tab, now you're gonna see a change. I'm gonna tell you what happened under the covers in a minute. When it happens. Okay, so you see request submitted, request submitted. So what just happened is this, the treasurer just received an email saying that, you have requested a check. That is their trigger to get on the system and to approve your check request. They also got a message in their message box saying that you requested a check, okay? So let's just go back to the home screen 
and see what we got here. Look at all the messages here. Check requests for existing clients. This is your mailbox, by the way. This is your message box. You've been assigned a case. Remember what I said? When you get assigned a case, you're going to get a message in the message box and you're going to get a, uh, an email. So these are all the messages there. We can always go back to that case anytime and pick up where we left off right there. So now what happens is the treasure actually acts on that. So you got to give me a minute because I got to play treasure for one second because I got to show you how to close the case. You cannot close this case yet. The only time you can close the case is after the treasurer has acted on your request. If you try closing that case at this point, CMS will not allow you to close that case with assistance until the treasurer acts on it. When the treasurer acts on it, you will get an email. You will get a message in your message box. That is your uh, clue, uh, clue to go in there and close the case. But I'm going to um, I'm going to play treasure in a minute. Let's see. Check. There you go. Check request. You, you could ignore this. This really isn't uh, that important right now. I'm going to, because you're not a treasurer. But I have to do this in order to show you something. This is what the treasurer does. And let's say I say mail, and I give a mail date, and I say approve. What time is it? Pardon me? 104. 104. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that's one. Let me go back and do the other one. I think the other one was Marietta Power. Put in a check number. I'm making this all up. Delivered to John Pepe. And he approves it as well. Okay. Now, if I go back to your case, case, your existing client case, come in here, key on existing client, go back to assistance. Uh, you might have to hit this restart button. It all depends where you are in the process. You see that the checks were paid? the status changed to paid and paid. Like I said, when the treasurer pays it, you will know it. You will get an email. Now you are ready to close this case. Very important. Once you are done with the case. Now you might leave this open because maybe you're waiting for a utility bill still to come in from the client and you're gonna pay you know, the natural gas bill as well, but you haven't seen the physical bill. So it's fine to leave it open until you're done. But when you are done, this is the time to close the case. So you're going to advance to the complete tab. You're going to put in a follow-up date. And there's all different definitions of that. Some conferences, some case workers actually use a follow-up to follow up with the client. Some use a follow-up to follow up with the vendor. Some just put in the current date. That is required. The date is required. You could put in some text if you want. That is not required. The only thing is required is that you put in a follow-up date. When you click complete, ask you, do you want to close the case? The answer is, of course I do. Done. Case is closed. There, that was the caseworker. Here's all the assistance. You can tab and see all the information that you put in, whatever. We're gonna to get to reopen a case in a minute, but not now. Hopefully we'll get to reopen a case. But I wanna work through the second example. Second example is a new client because there are some subtleties to this. So let's say the case that you just got assigned is a new client. How do you know it's a new client? 
Your first key is if you see a cancel button instead of a close case button. Because if you click cancel at this point, all is forgiven. Everything is wiped out from the system as if this case never took place. You cannot do that when the existing client. You must close the case with or without assistance. We're going to close this one without assistance because we closed the other one with assistance. So that's one key that you know it's a new client. The other way, just go to pass assistance. There isn't any. So we've never helped this client before. So that's how you know it's a new client. So we're going to go through the same steps we did before. We're going to put in, you know, what kind of visit it was, put in our time, our miles, click next. Did I not put in? Ah, I didn't put in the date. Good, it told me. And it highlighted the box too. Can't go any further until you put in the required fields. Okay, now this is a new client. Picture this, client left a voice message <clears throat> and your case and take person captured all the information that they could capture. But guess what? That's skeleton information. That is nowhere near complete. You see all the red asterisks? It's your job to make sure you capture that information when you go on the home visit. So they knew that it was a male, but they didn't know the marital status. On the home visit, you learn that they are single. So that's required. You didn't, they didn't know their ethnicity. So you found out they're Latina. That's required. Um, we have a phone number. We have an address. All that is good. We're good to go. Now, here's the important point. And here's where the magic happens with new clients. This client is not out on the database yet. If you try to search on this client, in this case, the client's name is new client, be John Smith, you will not find this client. It is kind of like held in a temporary area until you say, create client. When I click this button, that's when this client is gonna get written out on the database and watch carefully. That button that used to say cancel is going to change to close case, which now it is an existing client. Once I create the client, up to this point, it's a new client. If for some reason you want to get out of this, please, as long as the cancel button is visible, you just hit click cancel, the case is wiped out completely. Okay, so we're about ready to see the magic. We're going to say create client. Okay, that client now is written out on the database. Look what happened. That button now says close case. <clears throat> We're going to close this case without assistance. So let's say at this time we just determine, you know, I'm not going to give this client anything for whatever the reasons. The other one we gave them the shot. We gave him everything, right? And we went through a case where we gave a lot of assistance to a client. This case, we're given nothing. So we're gonna close the case. You click close case, you put the reason is because client found other resources. Uh, don't need our assistance, okay? Whatever, a, a, a reason is required. So we're gonna close this case, click submit. That case is now closed. Look at your my assigned case list now. Both cases are not there anymore. The existing client we close with assistance, the new client we close without assistance. They're done. They've been deleted from your assigned list, but I still got all these other cases I need to work. Okay? So that's uh, an existing client, new client. Now, <clears throat> an unassigned client. 
some conferences, and we are one, what we do is we don't assign cases to caseworkers. We just put them in the unassigned cases for caseworker folder, and whoever is available just picks them up. Some conferences have um, case managers. Mm -hmm. The case managers go into the unassigned cases for caseworker folder and assign cases out to different caseworkers. It can be based upon geography, where you live based upon where the client lives, and that might be a good match. It might be a case that you worked before and the case manager decides you're the best person to handle the case. Anyway, that is another way of how to work cases. Besides ones that go into my assigned cases folder, you might have some in unassigned cases. And by the way, you would have received an email when this case is placed in the unassigned cases for caseworker folder, you would have received an email saying, there's a case available. If you're interested, go get it. And you would click on my unassigned cases for caseworker. You would see the case. There's the case number. That's the client name. Here's the profile information. Once again, you probably want to learn about that client. This is what they're asking for. This is their past assistance. And let's say you are available and you want to pick it up. You would just click, you're accepting the case. Now, you may also say, I'm going to take it, but I'm going to sign a secondary. Susie's going to come with me as well. You can do that. But I'm going to make this real short because we have other things to do and we got 15 minutes left. But if your conference uses unassigned cases for caseworker, however they use it, that is a way for you to assign yourself to a case. Just go in there and get it. If that's what your conference allows you to do. If your conference says, no, you don't touch that folder, we have case managers that work that and they'll assign case, that's fine too. But in our case, Holy Family, we put everything in unassigned cases for caseworker folder, we don't sign to any specific caseworker. Whoever is available, go get it if you want that case. That could be on a weekend, whatever. So you would accept the case. And you're back here again. So if I went to my assigned cases folder, now I see I have that case in my folder and I'm ready to work it just like I did the existing client and the new client, okay? So we closed We closed a case with assistance and without assistance. I'm gonna show you how to reopen a case. Okay, so we're gonna to go to search. We're gonna to go to search cases and this is a good way to introduce you to the search cases function. You can search on any cases, one within your, uh, within your conference or anywhere throughout all the conferences, just leave it as select, okay? You can put in, I only wanna see the ones that were closed with assistance or without assistance. You can narrow down your search any way that you want. You could get it down to a specific client name or you could do, just put in the case number, 2022- zero zero one four eight that was our existing client uh case number that we closed so we do a search and there it is it came up okay so i, I was just showing you i'm going to show you two things one how to use the search cases function Anytime you need to search on a case, you can put in any criteria that you want. You can put a two from day, whatever, and it'll bring up a list that you can choose from. But I'm also going to take it a step further, and we're going to reopen this case. Let's say, and this happens, the client calls back two months later, three months later, and says, I need assistance. In our conference, we say, you know, if it's only been two months, more than likely the situation did not change. 
if it's been six or eight months, situation more than likely has changed to open up a new case. But if it's been a month or two, why go through opening up or, or going through opening up a new case? Why don't we just reopen the other case and add assistance to that case? Again, that is a conference call. Depends upon what your guidelines are. In our case, we use probably about the two, three month rule uh, that we will reopen a case. Anything greater than that, we will open up a new case. So you clicked on the case, you found the case, you click on reopen. By the way, it retains the same case number. It's not gonna create a new case number. It brings you to where you left off the complete tab. What you want to do is go to the assistance tab. And by the way, if you see this restart button, you must click it. And now I'm ready to add an additional assistance to that client. Okay. So let me get out of this and close it again. Like I said, you can't advance forward. You can advance backward or you can go backwards. Complete, yes. Okay, close the case again. Same case number, everything. The other thing I wanna show you in search was cases by caseworker. I showed you cases. I wanna show you cases by caseworker. So if you want to see just your open cases, you could put in if you want to narrow down to rent, utilities, whatever. But if I wanted to see all of my open cases, I would say, show me all of John Pepe's open cases. There's all of my open cases. If I want to say oh, it's John Pepe's open cases for uh, rent, there's my list just for rent, my clients that are open. So please use cases, cases by caseworker searches. The other search I wanna show you is by clients. So uh, I'm not gonna go through a long scenario about this, but I will tell you that there are times when you'll have to use the search client, uh, the search client feature because you can't figure out how to spell the client's name, first name or last name. That might be possible. So we have a client out there, Linda Chambers, but I don't know if it's L-Y-N-D-A or if it's L-I-N-D-A. I know it's an F. So I'm gonna put an L and I'm gonna use a wild card feature, which is a percent sign. So give me L in everything past that. L-Y, L-A, L-B, L-C, Chambers. Now do a search. Well, I found Linda Chambers right there. And she spells her name L-I-N-D-A. So I would click on Linda Chambers. Now this is the client's record. This has nothing to do with a case. Two different things. Remember, clients have multiple cases. So this is what's permanent. If you opened up another case on this client, this is the information the system would use. So that's the profile information. Here's the how, this is the most recent. Everything about that client. If that client's been red flagged, which they have, I, I made up this data. Just so that you can see that you can see all the information on that client by doing a client search. Okay, the next thing I wanna show you is volunteer hours. So if you go to my profile, there's a tab, volunteer hours. So the system tracks all the cases that you work. You don't have to worry about entering in those hours, or in this case, minutes in my, the system does that automatically when you completed that information on the visit tab, you don't need to worry about that. But there are some tasks that you're involved in 
that you should be capturing your time in your minds. So let's say that you wanted to add a task, okay? So let me see if I come down here. Okay, so here's, this one's open right here. This is for Holy Family. We'll put in today's date. Now, the category list you pick from. So if you attended a conference meeting and your conferences say, you know, you need to record your time. Some conferences say, don't worry about the secretary who will take care of it. They enter it in as one entry, totally up to your conference. If you want to record that you did member training like you're doing now, you would choose member training. And you want to record this time, this hour and a half that you're spending right now is member training. And it was for 90 minutes. And because of Zoom, you didn't have to travel anywhere. Zero. And then you would say save. And that time now has been recorded so that when the annual report prints out, and your president and your treasurer gets the annual report and they look at all the members' time. And by the way, that's summarized. That will be included. So we encourage all of our members to record all of their time. Like I said, the, the system already takes care of the visit itself. If you spend more time, let's say, on the case, and you didn't include it as part of the visit time, and that was case administration, you could always come here and add that additional time after. So let's say that you didn't know whether it was gonna be 75 minutes or 90 minutes. You put in 60 at the time of the visit, but it really turned out to be 90. You would come to your volunteer task, you would enter in 30 minutes for your, um, uh, case administration, and that got recorded, okay? The last thing I'm gonna show you, and of course open it up for questions, is the user guide. If you get stuck, and I will preface this by saying this user guide is somewhat outdated. I would say that it's probably 75% complete in terms of having all the functionality that's in the system, but what's in there is probably about 95% accurate. As you can see, it says release 3.0. Well, we're on release 4.0. This is in the process of being updated, but it's good. If you get stuck and you, you have a question, just go to the online user guide, click on casework introduction, and it'll take you to the different parts you can read about. Uh, any one of those uh, sections that you might be having a problem with. And that could be on the prepared, it's tab by tab. So we went over the tab. By the way, you can go through this after this training. You can read about the prepared tab and then it moves through the visit tab, the client tab, just what we just demo. So I highly encourage you to use that. If you get stuck and you have a question, use the online user guide. That's what it's there for. And now I am gonna open it up for questions with four minutes left, but I'm sorry, I apologize. It's a lot of material to cover, but I wanted to make sure it was complete. So the mic is open. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Okay, Betty. Um, I have um, a case where I was given a homeless person with only a phone number, no address, no other information. And I called that number for a week and I sent a text message and I haven't gotten any response. I get when the phone rings, it goes immediately to a message. Sorry for the inconvenience, but this number can't be answered or something like that. So I uh, can't leave a message. So do I just leave that until it falls off or do I close it as a case? It's not really been activated as a case because I haven't reached the person. 
Yeah, but you've been assigned it, right? Right. Yeah. So it is. It, is it is is it an existing client or a new client? It's a new client. New client. So you can cancel that case. Just go up to that cancel button and cancel it. What I would do is, and it happens to me quite a bit. Uh, I don't text them. I send them emails. Saying, well, there is no email address for this. I speaker. know, I know. In your case, there's no email, but I, if I got an email address, I will send them an email saying that I'm trying to reach you. I'll try to call you back. If I can't reach you, I'm going to close your case. And so, but, if but I how do I you, do I get credit for having called all week or no? It's just a, a non. Part of me. So if I close a case, it's credit that we handled a case. If I cancel a case. I forget where you said to cancel. I've closed cases. I've never canceled. Yeah. Well, cancel a case means it's gone. So that I just can let it go and it will fall away, right? Pardon me? If I'm told that if you don't do, if you don't enter anything, eventually it just disappears. Well, that's 30 days. Oh. So if you want to wait 30 days, yes, the system will take care of it for you. Okay. But it, in a real life situation, it, mm -hmm. I don't have a phone number, a good phone number. I don't have an email address. I don't have any contact. And I can't get in touch with that client. And I've tried and I tried and I tried. I would cancel the case, let them call back. This time, giving you good information. That's me as a caseworker. Okay. You want to do it differently? That's up to you. You want to leave it out there? It's going to stay out there for 30 days. And then it's going to go into this abandoned case folder right here. See this? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Right there? Yes. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go there. It's going to be abandoned, we'll say, as a, an assigned case. Uh -huh. And eventually, it's going to go. Okay. Okay? Okay, thank so, you. But either way, I get rid of it personally, but that's me. Well, show me again real quick how do you cancel a case? Because I must have missed uh, I don't know if I can, but here's what you do. When you're assigned the case and you're on the prepare tab, look uh -huh. for the cancel button. Okay. Okay. Look for the cancel button and then you'll see it. And then all you got to do is click that. Everything's gone. Okay. Thank you very much. You bet. Another question? Yeah, John, what is pledge assistance? What is pledge assistance? Yeah, I, I bypassed that because I did a whole session on pledges. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, so you can watch the video, but in effect, some conferences, and we are one of them, uh, we will, when we talk to a client, we issue them a pledge, and that's predicated on them raising their share of, whether it's the rent or utilities. When they have done so, we then turn that pledge into a check request. But there is a whole video session on that. I invite you to go uh, look at it. All right, thanks. You bet. And there's handouts too on that. Any other questions? I have one. Um, when you are trying to see if a person is in the system, you're supposed to do that through client intake, right? That is correct. Okay. So you do the intake, you find the case, and then you find out that you don't need to open a new case because there's, there's already a record uh, in the database. So if I were to click cancel, the message is this will delete the case and the action can't be undone. So even if it's an inquiry in the inquiry stage, it's still going to delete the whole case. Well, let, let's take it step by step. So you're in client inquiry and you come across a client and the client's an existing client? Right. Okay. So what do you want to do? And then you're still in the inquiry stage? Right. Yeah. So if you click cancel, it's gone, period. The whole case or just the inquiry? No, the... The case, you opened up a case, you're in the inquiry phase right. of the case. Right, but you find an existing record. So you go, okay. Oh, the record's, the record's still there. Oh, okay. The record is still there. That inquiry, don't forget, 
if you haven't moved from inquiry to case, mm -hmm. and you know that because you have an INQ number, yeah. you're, you're just in the inquiry phase of case intake. And so when you okay. can cancel that case that you're trying, that you're about ready to open is uh -huh. gone. The case, not the client. <sighs> Oh, the, the one you're trying to open. Okay, because the, the message is a little scary because it says this will delete the case. And, yeah. you know, not knowing the difference between case and client, it kind of freaks me out. Yeah, well, that is like the first thing. Um, yeah, okay. You know, you, you got to understand that there is, there's supposed to be one client throughout the entire state of Georgia but that's okay. not the case. Okay, okay, There's got supposed it. to be one, but multiple cases. I could yeah. I could be working that client, Holy Family. You uh -huh. could be working that client a year later. My case, my client today might be your client tomorrow. Okay, you just want to be careful not to close some active case, right? Do any uh, cancel inquiry even in an active case? Or it's uh, different. You're, 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 yeah, you're confusing okay. cases again with, with the with client. Clients. Inquiry it. is still part of case intake. It's okay. just the first phase of it. Okay, got it. I think I, I understand it now, but it's, um, you know, when I when I looked at it, it seemed kind of ominous, but it's really not as long as you don't have a case number. That's right. Once okay. you're given a case number, you could. You can still cancel it, but that's a different story. That's a different story. But yes, if you're in the inquiry phase, you can cancel it anytime you want. If it's a new client, you can cancel. If it's an existing client, you can't. You got to close it. Okay, Any other questions? Hi. Yeah, I have one question. Sometimes when you create a client, um, a little database comes up or a little accordion beneath that has other clients with similar names and you get a tab that says merge client. Are there any tips and, and suggestions you have for using that? When you're creating a new client, where, where are you in the flow? Help me out. Um, let's see. I think it's, at are the you on the beginning. prepare tab? Are you yeah, on yeah. The... I think it's, uh, I've run into it after on the prepare tab after you accept a client. And sometimes there has been, once I've accepted the client and I'm preparing a little, a little database has come up and it says, you know, it is this client already in here. And you can click, you, you know, you look through the list and say, none of those are my client or one of them is probably my client at, a, at another time. And there's a button that says merge client. Hmm. I, I can't picture this, unfortunately. We do have a merge clients feature. The merge clients feature appears two places that I know. Uh, it's actually merge request. Okay. One is during case intake, and one is on the client search screen. That's two places. You might be clicking, if this is an existing client or a new client? It was a new client. Yeah. You might be clicking the next. You remember when I had create client? Remember that button? Yes. Yes. You might be clicking next instead of create client. And therefore, okay. it will take you back through the cycle of identifying the client. You don't want to do that. You want to always, if it's a new client and you've entered in all the information and you're ready to have the system post that to the database, you click the create client button. The only time I've seen something like you're describing is when the user clicks the next button, which you shouldn't be doing. Okay, that's what I needed to know, thanks. Yeah, that might be it, but I really have to sit and think about it because I haven't seen that come up. Thank um, you. John, you I, have have a, I have a question um, about the defer verification. Yes. Um, my previous 
experience has not been successful, you know, hopefully you just don't make a mistake. But if you do, what the, when you do defer verification, um, it seems like no man's land. So what's your question, ma'am? When I, I have, if you've made a mistake, the client, you put her name and it's rent and you go to the next thing where you check the two rent and the name of the uh, mortgage company or whatever. Um, and you and you realize you made a mistake and you and there's defer verification. But like you, you want to pause and correct it. Um, yeah, well, okay. So you click defer verification. What it did was bring you back to the screen. Uh -huh. it's, it's not complete yet. You haven't submitted the request. You would then click on it. And then there'll be an edit button for each section, the payment section. So let's say you made the mistake on the payment side, uh -huh. you can correct it and click save. If you made a payment with the vendor, say you just picked the wrong vendor, uh -huh. you, you could then make the correction and click save. Okay. So there is opportunity for you to fix it, even though you deferred the verification. Okay. I think that I have just gone on onto the name, say, and tried to change it, and it doesn't allow you to do that. So you're saying there's an edit feature. There is an edit for for the transaction that you're submitting. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. All you do is click on it, and you'll see it'll be, it'll be a top and a bottom window. Uh huh. The top window would be for the payment information. And you'll have an edit button. Uh huh. And then there'll be a line. And then there'll be the vendor information and there'll be an edit button. edit button. Okay, I think I've missed that edit button. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions? Hi, John. No yes. Yeah, just a follow-up question on the, on the first uh, question that uh, Betty asked. So, when you cannot get in touch with that particular client before you close or cancel the case, is, is there an area in the system that you can put why you are canceling the case or you can just cancel automatically or? No, when you, when you cancel the case, it never asks you for a reason why. When you close the case, now, you know, you could advance that to a situation where you get the close case button, I don't know how you do that because you don't have any information on that client. Okay. Uh, then you'd be able to close that case without assistance and you'd be able to record the reason, but no, there isn't any. Now, what I would do is I would go out to uh, search. I would go to clients. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. That's not an existing client. So you can't put anything on their permanent record. That was one, that was a new client, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yes, that's a new that client. That she was referring to. Yeah, that isn't going to work because the client would have to be in um, in the database. So, not. so the only thing you can do, in, in other words, is you just cancel it without any notation or anything on that particular uh, uh, neighbor. That's right. Okay. That's right. Thank yeah, you. you just, I mean, it is what it is. But yeah, you're just canceling the case and saying they'll call back. Yeah. You hope they call back. Yeah, and also you have to add that the volunteer the time that you spend on that particular neighbor supposedly to, because that is yeah, you can go volunteer. over to yeah. exactly. You go to volunteer task and you put in your time. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Okay, I thank you very much for your time. I apologize, I ran over, uh, but it's a lot of material to cover in a very short period of time. So take care, have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you, great Bye. session. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Thank you. Bye.
Hey, Lisa, it's Lori. Um, I was just calling to remind you that it's tonight at six for dinner. And could you let me know what you're bringing? Because I'm trying to get it organized. It hasn't um, really been organized. Uh, I'll talk to you in a, a little while. Thank you. Bye. Yeah,